the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the most produced German AFV, Tactics and Strategy, Air Support in Tank Arcade, and Metal Beasts, the comrade to the famous Schilke. We rarely review anti-aircraft vehicles, so today we're happy to speak about the ZSU-37-2 Yenisei, found at BR-8.3. In the mid-1950s, the Soviet Union sought to develop some new anti-aircraft gun systems. Work had been started on two machines at the same time, with Schilke aiming for providing air defense on altitudes up to one and a half kilometers, and Yenisei up to three kilometers. This machine's armament is a twin, two-plane, stabilized 37 mm gun with elevation angles between minus three and plus 87 degrees. The ammo is situated around the turret, while the roof houses the radar system. The engine compartment of this SPAAG is in the front, next to the driver. Other crew members are in the turret. As you would expect from an anti-aircraft gun, the Yenisei is good at handling enemy aircraft. With a tracking radar and a couple of high-speed, high-velocity barrels, it can easily destroy just about any enemy plane in a couple of kilometers radius. For ammo, you can choose among three types of belts. Mixed, H-E-F-I-T, and A-P-T. We recommend you go for the latter, since it's just as good against enemy planes as the HEFI, but also pretty suitable against ground vehicles. Yeah, it's true. The Yenisei belongs to the class of SPAAGs that can defend themselves even against tanks. Thanks to the same chassis as on the SU-100P tank, this machine is pretty mobile, moving in both forward and reverse. Which means it can move around the battlefield pretty quickly and even flank enemy tanks. And there's a reason to do that, since no early MBT can handle a volley of rounds with 85 millimeters of penetration to the side. Just avoid any frontal attacks if you can. By the way, thanks to the SPAAG level of turret rotation speed, you can feel like a king in urban skirmishes. Still, much like any other machine, the Yenisei comes with a set of compromises and disadvantages. The first and the most significant one has to do with the direct purpose of this machine. Its radar rotates very slowly, with a full circle taking almost 20 seconds. So, you'd better use the 3 or the 60 degrees scanning sectors and look around for air targets with your own eyes. Second, the NSA has no night vision, so it's almost useless if there's no light. The last, but not the least, disadvantage is its survivability. Due to paper-thin armor and a heap of explosives in the turret, even large-caliber machine guns are a threat to it so be very attentive and careful when playing it. If you do, this SPAAG will benefit you with a nice series of air frags. During the 1930s, the German army relied on two medium tanks. The 37mm Panzer III was to become the most produced one, while the 75mm Panzer IV was to be used as fire support. A while later, a new type of machine joined them, the Assault Gun. Ironically though, it was that machine that surpassed both Panzer III and IV and became the most produced instead. Let's see how it happened. In 1936, Colonel Erich von Manstein suggested a concept of assault artillery, and soon enough, Daimler Benz was commissioned to make some. The engineers used the chassis of the Panzer III 
and the 75mm gun similar to the one on Panzer IV, but instead of putting it onto a turret, they opted for an integrated gun casemate. The new machine became known as the Sturmgeschutz III, or simply Sturm III. At first glance, it maybe seemed like something redundant. Uh, one might wonder why put this cumbersome gun on a Panzer III chassis when there's a Panzer IV already created specifically for it? Well, the thing was, the Panzer IV had been meant for tankers, while von Manstein was pushing the idea of self-propelled artillery to tell and help uh, infantry. While self-propelled howitzers were used for long-distance shelling and the tank destroyers were used for ambushes, the new assault guns were meant to reinforce the soldiers in their attacks and provide direct fire support. For this, the only thing they needed was a closed combat compartment. Even a machine gun was unnecessary since the neighboring infantrymen would provide cover. The Stug III saw its first combat in France and performed pretty efficiently. By July 1941, the Germans had more than 10 battalions of such machines at the Soviet border. The Soviets already knew about this machine but didn't care as much. They'd done a quick study of some captured Stugs and came to a conclusion that its armor was too thin to provide protection against any artillery. <laughs> they were wrong. Later, tests showed that frontal armor was absolutely invincible to 45mm guns. The English two-pounder turned out to be useless against it too. The only gun capable of penetrating this armor was the American 37mm, and only at point-blank range. The Soviet Union called the Stug III an assault tank, or Archsturm. They had no alternative of their own since all similar Soviet vehicles had an open compartment. After they learned what the Stug was, they started working on the Su-122. The Stug had some influence on the Axis countries too. In 1941, the Italians started producing their own machine, the M41 tank destroyer. Ironically, while Italian tanks became obsolete very quickly, the assault guns made on their bases were in demand throughout the whole war. Originally, only a support machine, the Stug III, ended up becoming the most produced German Caterpillar-based armored vehicle. More than 10,000 of them were made in total, including the Stu 42 modification. To put it into perspective, the most produced German tank, the Panzer IV, hadn't even made it to 9,000. Once again, cost efficiency, reliability, and simplicity proved superior in wartime. In Tank Arcade, you can receive some air support if you earn special spawn points by destroying enemy vehicles and some other activities. Each air battle can have only one aircraft with a ground strike capability, such as an attack aircraft or a bomber, as well as fighters for cover and interception. The only exception is players driving light tanks. They can jump into a ground strike type of aircraft together with an Allies bomber or attack aircraft without waiting for the next air battle. One point gives you access to a fighter, useful for covering allies or intercepting enemies. Don't rush to leave your plane if there's no enemy aircraft left though. If you spot enemy machines with weak armor or an open compartment, you can try attacking them with your cannons. Two points give you access to an attack aircraft, which usually comes with rockets or a couple of bombs. Their main advantage is precision. Try to go for the lightest targets first, since they're easy to destroy, even with cannons, if you run out of your suspended armament. Moreover, it's the best way to quickly dispose of that annoying couple of enemies that block your and your team's way. 
Why expose your tank? Get an aircraft attack and clear the way. Three points give you access to a bomber. Bombs are the best against enemy crowds or single unmoving targets. You should keep in mind that the time fuse is set to 10 seconds. That means you shouldn't dive onto an enemy or drop bombs at a close distance because it leaves too much time for them to leave the explosion area. Keep the distance at around one and a half to two kilometers to the target. This way, the time fuse would be just enough to explode the bomb on ground contact. Starting at BR 8.7, you can see some helicopters on the battlefield. The score access spread is similar. For one point, you get a machine with guns or cannons to support or intercept. For two points, you get rockets. And for three, 80 GMs. If you earn enough for the latter, start looking for enemy aircraft vehicles first. Destroying them with a guided missile won't be a problem, even at a great distance. Finally, one of the recent additions to arcade battles is the nuclear bomb. For 15 spawn points, you can get access to a strategic bomber that can win the battle instantly. Well, assuming you manage to get to the map and drop the bombs, of course. Don't forget about your tank's safety. It stays in place inactive and highly vulnerable while you're flying. Try to find a safe position beforehand, some place where no one would disturb you. If the enemy gets really close to you right after you spawn an aircraft, don't hesitate to return. You lose nothing when the plane goes down, while losing your tank can be upsetting for obvious reasons. A good time to go fly is a little when you are about to launch a lengthy repair process or replenish your crew. Since it doesn't stop while you're in the air, <laughs> why not do both? Rushing an air spawn isn't always worth it. Sometimes you should keep the points until you see a perfect opportunity. If your machine is heavily damaged and you have no time to find a shelter, you can risk it. Assuming your tank lasts the 15 seconds needed for the countdown, you can get your air spawn and either save the machine or get your revenge for it. Well, that's everything that we wanted to share about air assault in a tank arcade today. Share your own experience in the comments while we answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called L Squad Dog. What's the best way to play the Super Pershing? Hi there! The main advantage of the Super Pershing is its thick frontal armor that can hold off against most guns in that class. Still, it comes with its own vulnerabilities. The so-called turret cheeks, for example. If your enemy catches you during a reload, Try to wiggle your turret. It will certainly make aiming harder and may even save you from seeing the hangar screen too early. Hanson Henry asks, why do most jets have spikes on their noses? Hello, Henry. Looks like what you mean is the pito tube or the pitostatic system. This ingenious device is used to determine an aircraft's speed and altitude. Another question comes from Jesse Moncou. Why did Grumman Naval Aircraft have CAT at the end of the name? Hi, Jesse. During World War II, Grumman became famous for its carrier-based fighters, the Wildcat and the Hellcat. So, the cat part of the name became a tradition and a trademark for the company. This is a duck, writes. Please do a section on early jet tactics. Hi there. It's too small of a topic for a separate section, but we're more than happy to give you some advice right now. 
Most early jets have one distinct feature, very low dynamics. Right after takeoff, late piston engine machines can easily outspeed and outclimb them. Which means you shouldn't try to gain altitude before you gain some speed. Fly level for a while first and then start lifting your nose slowly up to around 10 degrees. And the last comment for today was written by Cookie. Idea for a challenge. Try to destroy a tank using Schläger Musik cannons. Hi Cookie. You simply won't stop surprising us with your imagination. <laughs> Can't promise to do it right now, but we'd love the idea. So it's certainly coming. Once more, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos, and you mustn't miss them because I'm narrating them. Don't forget to leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, keep your tanks safe while you're up in the sky, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>